TA frantically adjusting the microphone means that class is about to get started, by the way. So, hello guys. Nice to see your lovely faces this week. I know it's chilly, so I appreciate you making... I like the Miss America wave. So I appreciate you guys making the cold journey out here. Unfortunately, it's probably going to get worse through November into December. But that's okay, we're here now, and we're gonna get started with EMP. So slides, you'll find a nice little Google Doc link as per usual. It should take you someplace over here. Should see even more practice week 10. And if there aren't any questions immediately, we'll go ahead and get started. Cool. All right, so your weekly links for giving feedback. This is just for EMP, so an anonymous feedback form just for EMP here. Um, quick reminder, um, if I didn't make it clear before, this is just whenever you feel like you have feedback. This doesn't have anything to do with the survey or anything. This is just if you have something to say, it's a good place to say it. And then similar story with the suggestion form um, for the topics. It's also completely anonymous, completely optional. Just if there's ever a time that you have a suggestion that you want as far as topic wise, you can find that link there. So hopefully that clarifies a bit. Questions there? Cool? Makes sense? So, what have we done since last time? So we're going to hit data structures again a little bit. Uh, same with recursion. And then we saw a couple sorting algorithms. Um, I won't spoil the ones that I think you guys are going to see tomorrow. But I know that you guys have seen insertion sort. And then lab, I believe it was bubble sort and selection sort. Is there any forms of protest? OK, cool. So. We'll mostly be focusing on the data structures recursion part, but I also have a couple slides on sorting algorithms. So yeah, lecture review. So I thought actually um, just kind of going through an excruciating detail example on reversing a linked list might start throwing concepts together. That was a really great suggestion. I like that. So basically, Given a linked list of items, create a method in the linked list class so that reverses the list. And I think of it as learning how to knit, but instead of yarn, you have references. So I like to throw that out there, even though nobody appreciates it. I can't let my thoughts stay inside my head. So yeah. <laughs> so. I know that we're going to be talking about linked lists right now, but you can really kind of think of a lot of the strategies with any of the data structures, especially since um, apart from arrays, a lot of these have references that are linking the structures to one another or some means of connecting them together. So even though this is just for a linked list with one connection to each other, you can kind of think about how it expands more globally. So. Reversing a linked list, step one, what do we have? So this is an important first step on figuring out like what exactly we have given to us. So in linked list, we have a reference to start of the list. And in items, we have the value and the reference to the next item. So that's how we're going to be able to traverse. And especially with your MPs and everything like that, other things that you're going to have given to you is the documentation, which you should read. Just saying, <laughs> it'll give you a lot of hints on like what you should be doing, and especially since the parameters, I, in my opinion, are very nicely named and can kind of give you a hint on what you should be doing. But for now, we just have these given to us in our in our minds. We have expertise about references now, and then we have iterative knowledge and recursion knowledge, so we're good to go. So step two, the first thing that you should probably be thinking about after you've gathered all your utilities is start thinking about scenarios. So what happens if the list is null? Well, we can't call it anyway. So cool. 
Uh, what happens if the list is empty? Will an empty list reverse is an empty list? Cool. This is super easy already, right? What happens if the list size is one? A list of one element is the same reverse. Really good at reversing linked lists right now. If, but what happens if the list is greater than size one? So that's where the more interesting part comes in. So let's draw it out and spend way too much time on Java garbage collection. Because the main key to this is that we need to make sure that once we start drawing out the length list and trying to reverse it, that we don't lose references to any of the items there. Otherwise, they're going to fall into the Java garbage collection. And we're going to have no way to access them, and we're going to lose our length list, or at least part of it. So drawing it out to start, so I just pick some random numbers, 7, 23, 25, and then we have our start. And then we have next, next. And then the final next on the last element looks at null because that's what happens with the linked list. Once you get to the end, there's nothing else to look at, so it looks at null. Cool in the setup? All right. So when we're actually thinking about it, we need to make the previous items the current next item. So we have two references there that we should probably keep track of. But we also still need to make sure that we have a way to get to the next element or the current, current next So in order to keep reversing the list. So I'm just going to call it R next for reverse next rather than the items next. So it gets kind of confusing with all the next. But is that kind of clear on we probably want those three things at our disposal to use. Cool? All right. So we'll go ahead and draw them out. So let's get the three pointers going. So we can go ahead and start out current to the start at start because that's going to be the first thing that we want to reverse. So we're currently at start. And then we can just set previous and next. We can just start those at null. So those again, we'll look at null. So far, so good? Nothing too outrageous or crazy? Cool. So now let's do interesting stuff. First, before we start reversing, we want to make sure that we're looking at the next element. Because as soon as we reverse it, where next is going to be looking at previous, we need a way to hold on to the next element so it doesn't fall into the fiery pit of death with the Java garbage collection. I spent way too much time drawing, but that's okay. It was well worth it. So we go ahead and set our next to current's next, so that way we still have access to it even once we're done reversing the list. So next, we're safe to go ahead and set the first. Um, so since the first node becomes the last node in the reverse length list, and the last node's next is null, just as we saw over here with our normal linked list, we can make current look at previous since it was sent to null, and null is null is null is null. So we've done a reverse. That's cool. Does that make sense right there, first, first iteration? All right, cool. So the way that we're going to progress is that since we have all our objects still have a reference to it. We have a way to access it. So we're going to move current to our next, since that's going to be the next element that we want to reverse. And then we want to move previous to what used to be the current, because that's going to be the next previous that we're going to want the current to look at. So that's a lot of the same words all at once. But does that make sense? So the next iteration, you want to move the current and previous pointers so you could do the next reverse on the individual item. Kind of weird, but OK. Cool. So now we repeat. So if you remember before, we went ahead and set the um, reversing next ahead to current's current dot next because we wanted to make sure that we still had access to it even once we do the reverse on the item. So that we saw before. And then again, before we set currents next to the previous, what previous is currently pointing to. 
then we slide it over. We still have access to everything. It's great, life is good. We move rnx to currents.next. It's okay if rnx looks at null. We go ahead and set currents.next uh, to previous. We slide everything over. And now current is now looking at null. We've reached the end of the list. Everything's reversed. So we're done, right? Cool? Reverse, reverse the link list? Oh, we still have to start looking at the beginning. But don't worry. We just set start to previous, and now we're good. So now we're done. Now let's actually code it, because computers don't understand drawings, even if they're as beautiful as mine. Just saying. OK, so first, we're kind of going to want to map out the algorithm. So as we saw before, we can just go ahead and set current to the start of the list. And we're going to set previous to null and rnx to null. So while we're not at the end of the list, rnx, we're going to go ahead and move it to currents next. So we have a way to get to it once we do the reversing. We set current.next to previous. And then we go ahead and shift everything for the next iteration. So previous becomes current, and current becomes rnx. So we do that until we're at the end of the list, and then the last thing that we need to do is set start to previous. Pull on the algorithm pseudocode. Yeah, like reversing a linked list seems so intimidating, and when I first saw this, I almost thought it was infuriating that it only takes a couple of steps each time, but. When you start drawing some of these things out, like they start to make more sense and become less weird and scary. So I highly recommend, especially with your MP, drawing out everything. And you have Android with you, so just be sure that you're doing stuff on paper as well. So what does this actually look like in Java? Well, pretty similar. Um, so we have the same stuff as before, item previous is null, current start, our next, while current is not equal to null, so that's how we're going to know if we're at the end of the length list. We go ahead and repeat our four steps, and then at the end we can go ahead and set start to previous. So next step, see if it works, just in case you don't believe me because I'm not writing any code. So I have a linked list going. It's what we've kind of seen before with the item inside, with a value and a next. I just have a single constructor here. And then private item start. So this is in the linked list class. So we have our start. I just have a linked list constructor that's that start to null. Have a bunch of stuff that I add to front. I have a print method. I'll come in handy. And then here's our reverse. So we have previous null, current is equal to start, and redundant, but I don't care. It makes me feel better, so I leave it like this. So our next is equal to null. So while current is not equal to null, we're going to go ahead and move our next to currents.next so we keep track of it, do the reversing, and shift everything over. And then once they're done with that, we set start to previous. So I have a linked list here. I just add a bunch of stuff to the front. So since I'm adding it to the front each time, 0 through 10 is going to go 987654321. And I go ahead and reverse the list. And now it prints in ascending order. So cool. Link list stuff is fun. All right, awesome. Well, if you're looking at my other code, you will see spoilers for the recursive one, but that's OK. We'll get to that. First, just a quick analysis of what's going on. So especially if you see, like, you might be asked for a test, or if you um, go for interviews, you might have to analyze your solution. 
So the time complexity, we set some references to help us out in the beginning. So those all take constant time to assign stuff. We then go through the entire length list of n items and we're going to do this every single time. But all the operations inside are again just setting stuff to other things. So those are all constant time. We then have one more constant set where we set start to previous. So we have a bunch of constant operations in the beginning, a bunch of constant operations that occur n times, plus the constant operation at the end gives us big O of n time to do. Cool there? Quick analysis good? And since we're not using an array or anything, which if you wanted to reverse it by adding everything to an array or something crazy like that, you could, but that would increase the space complexity. But here we just have a couple extra references, which all the references take constant space, so that's big O of one. So constant space. Does that make sense? Cool. So optimize if possible. Nah, this is already pretty optimal. So it's good to think about, though, for interviews and such. So again, interviewers, they might ask you to analyze your solution and ask if you can optimize, if so, how. Or if you're given a complexity your solution has to be and you're not meeting it, then you might want to think of ways to optimize. But we don't have to do that. We're good. So now we get to party. And I have a fun little animation. I think this is in um, either C or C++, but it's the same stuff that we're doing. And now you can read a different programming language. So cool. But we already interviewed and we got an internship. And now you're working for a boss. And your boss says you have to use recursion to reverse the list bosses, right? So how are we going to go about doing this? So luckily, we already know the general structure of what we're going to do. We already drew it out. So now we just have to start um, converting it into a recursive way of thinking. So the first step is establishing a base case. So how do we know uh, where we should stop? So if we're at the end of the list, and a good thing to keep in mind is that at the very end of everything, we update start. So that might be a good place to do it. Next, the recursive step. So how do we make progress? Well, as we saw before with the iterative one, we were moving the current and previous forward each and every time. So we go, hmm, maybe these should be our parameters for when we actually have the recursive function. So far, so good. Combining results. So how do we combine our reversing? Well, we basically just do the reversing step. So we're reversing every single item. And then just basically ensuring that the steps that we take keep our length list intact so we're not losing anything. So the result of each individual reverse rever results in a completely reverse length list. So that's OK. So fourth, putting it all together. So I say to myself, self, what you're saying makes sense. But I have no idea how to put this all together, let alone how to code it. So that's fine. Let's just start out with what we know. So I'm referring to, um, at least in like the functional programming world and Haskell world, there's a thing called worker wrapper. So I don't know if you actually learned that terminology, but it's what I call it. So you might have noticed this in your MP5 where you write um, two functions of the same name, and one of them is like the big one that the testing suite actually calls, and then you actually have the worker one that does the recur 
uh, recursive work, and then the wrapper one that the testing suite calls, um, that one basically just calls the worker and it's like a single line of code. So that's what's going on here. And if that's not clear, um, it'll probably become more apparent uh, once we go over the worker and wrapper for um, actually reversing this list. So that was a lot of words, but does that make sense? <laughs> Man, a lot of W and R words in programming becomes really difficult to say. So, anyways. <laughs> so the worker, so we have the reverse, and as we saw before, since we're moving the current and previous every time, those are probably going to be the parameters that we are going to want to use in the worker um, method. So. These are going to be what you're going to want to keep in mind for MP5 as well on how are you actually moving forward in the progression as whoop. projectors. They're great. So seeing what you actually need to make progress each and every time. So in this case, it's the current and previous since those need to move up every time. And then the wrapper. So. The wrapper, we're just going to call reverse like we did before. We don't actually want the user, whoever's using our code, to actually have to put start and then null to begin. So we'll just make a wrapper method for them that automatically calls the reverse worker with start and null as arguments. Cool there? All right. So we have one function done. Just putting a little sanity check. So if start is equal to null, which means that we have an empty list. So if it's not equal to null, we can go ahead and call the function. And I'm pretty sure um, CheckStyle would yell at me for that kind of syntax. So that's OK. CheckStyle's not here. So we take care of the empty list, or uh, just make sure that start isn't equal to null, because a list of size 0 is the same reverse, so we don't actually have anything to do, and it's a void method. So if start is not equal to null, we go ahead and call our reverse with start as the current and null as the previous. So. Let's go ahead and get the base case done. So we know that if current.next is equal to null, we can do our last reversal where we set current.next to previous. And then we set start to current. And then since we're going to have other stuff in the function later that we don't want to execute because we've already hit our base case, we could just throw a return in there to make sure. And you might be thinking, Leah, last time we stopped, it was when current was equal to null. Yeah, we could also do it that way. Um, checking current.next is equal to null saves us a recursive call. So if we felt like it, um, if it shouldn't matter on how many calls that you make. But this still generalizes to big O of n, though. So either way is fine as long as your code works, but just a quick note on that. Questions on base case or anywhere in the process? Cool. So recursive step, making progress part one. So as we saw before, we want to make sure that we save the next or the recursive next so we can move forward. So that's where our R next is going to come in. So we go ahead and set it to current.next. That will set us up for the making progress, but that'll, part two will come later. Next, combining results. So building on our reverse, um, this is basically setting the current.next to previous. So everything that previous is pointing to will be what we had been building on. And that's the way that we're combining our results. So we go ahead and set current next to previous. So back to recursive step, make progress part two. So this part I actually think is like the cool part. So our next is going to become our current in the next recursive call. 
and then current is going to become our previous in the next call. So you can see as it gets to the bottom of this function, our next is going to take the current um, parameter and previous or current is going to take the previous parameter. Questions there? I wouldn't have thought of this immediately on my own, but hopefully seeing examples starts to kind of give you a more recursive frame of, frame of mind. So here's what it's going to look like in Java code. So it's kind of a common practice to have your uh, wrapper methods as public to call and then your recursive worker uh, methods to be private, but as long as you're from fulfilling your MP requirements, it doesn't matter, but that's what I'm used to. So we have the public void recursive reverse, and then it's just going to call our private recursive reverse. And again, we can call these the same method names because they take uh, different parameters, so this one doesn't take any. And this one takes two items, so that's perfectly fine. So a quick refresher on that. So now I should probably prove to you that this works. So here's our recursive reverse. So if start is not equal to null, we go ahead and call our recursive reverse with parameters. And then as we saw before, if current.next is equal to null, we go ahead and do our last reversal, set start to current, and then we return. Otherwise, we have item our next, so we keep track of the next thing that we'll want to recurse in reverse. It's kind of fun. <laughs> I don't think recurse is actually a word, but that's okay. <laughs> it is now. Yes, I like that. So we have our next call, and then current.next, we go ahead and set to previous. So we do the actual reversal. And then we go ahead and make our recursive call using our next as our new current and the current as our new previous. So we go ahead and call our public one without any parameters. And I'll leave the reverse in there as well. So 9876543210. And then we reverse it with our iterative reverse. So we have ascending order. And then the, our recursive version is like, nah, we're going descending again. Cool. Questions there? And again, if you're anything like me, if I were sitting in your shoes, I would be like, I, there is no way I would ever be able to think about doing it like that. Like, you make it sound so easy, it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating. <laughs> but hopefully, like, seeing kind of example that you can kind of base off of um, helps, like, at least get you in the mindset or you can kind of base some of your other solutions off of, of like, oh, okay, so this is how you would break it down or I can think of this iteratively, here's how I would do it recursively. It's getting toasty now. So again, like, just as how like this is an example that you might be able to build off of just for other stuff that you can do with recursion or linked lists. Well, if you're thinking about how, well, you just did it for linked lists, how do I do it for trees? Well, you just did this for a very specific tree slash binary tree. So if you think about how you did this for just a single branch tree, you would just think about how do you incorporate um, more references or connections between the two nodes. Yeah? Would we like, have to establish some sort of order? As in, like, the, like, as in, like, you have to sort it with the multiple branch tree? Because, I mean, the single branch tree doesn't 
actually have to be sorted if it has like some sort of like, you know, just this is the one path. But if you had like multiple branch trees, if you were like re trying to reverse it, you could traverse down this branch first and like reverse those, or traverse down two and then A and then reverse those. So for the multiple branch, you have to like establish like, because I mean, there you see like that B1, 2A, and then C9, and B0. Mm -hmm. How does it, how do you know that you'll? So, well, ultimately, as long as you go all the way down, where it, only after you reach um, a leaf where you don't have children to reverse, they are going to come up and then make sure you do everything on the other side. So you basically want to go the depth of the, the tree on picking either side, left or right, and as you come back up, so um, the way that you would actually, uh, have you guys learned about like uh, pre-order and in order and post-order yet? Probably not. I don't, I don't remember seeing those on slides, so I won't get too much into that. But basically, um, you want to make sure that the children are um, reversed first before you come back up, so you will want to go left and then go right, and then once you come back up, then you reverse left and right. So um, you could go right and then left. Um, it wouldn't particularly matter as far as I can tell, but basically your base case would be uh, you wouldn't do any reversing. Um, so if you have zero children, so you're a leaf, you would come back up, and then um, the node that made that call on the left child. So let's say we're at C. So um, nine doesn't have any children. So left, right, it comes back up. And then before C reverses his children, you would also want to go on the right side. So um, zero, we see that it has a child F. So we would go down, F has zero children. So it comes back up, it has no children on the right side. So, oops, <laughs> so. <laughs> so F would actually become the right child, and then we would go back up to zero. Uh, what we just did as soon as F becomes the right child, so after we go left, go right, then we reverse the children. That sounds very weird out of context. <laughs> um, so then nine had nothing to be done, and zero's been reversed, so we're back at C. So it went left, it went right. So now it's ready to reverse its children. So zero would now be on the left and nine would now be on the right. And since C was on this side, we assumed that we already did it for two. So C and two would switch sides. So basically it would just be kind of a different base case. So instead of um, the one dot next is equal to null, you would make sure that both children are null. Yeah, so you just, so the way that I interpret like reversing um, a binary tree is just slip, switching the left and right. Yeah, but what you could do if you want it is, um, Oh, flipping a tree over. <laughs> that sounds more fun in real life, but. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe if it was like um, a binary search tree where it has the properties where the left children have to be less than the right children, and you went to and you would have some sort of tiebreaker function, but um, the very, um, deepest or, uh, yeah, the deepest leaf that you could find and make that yeah. the new root. 
and then reload everything, um, just maintaining the binary search tree properties. You could do something like that. I'm not going to do it, but you, you can. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, is it in order? So if you load up all the nodes from a binary tree, um, if you um, basically go left, visit, and then go right. So um, when you would start, you would go left, so the order would be A2, 1, um, and then go, would it be C next? Um, basically, if it's um, in an in order um, traversal and it's just linked where you're right, so um, you would find the children by going to um, the depending on if you start the, so um, there's a formula that you could actually calculate on um, where to go, how far out um, from the children from, um, let's say you load the binary tree into an array, so whatever array index, and then you find the children, so if you start at zero, so you would go to the I believe it's 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 2, if that math works out. So then uh, the first node would be at 3 and 4. So that's how you would find the children that way. Um, I can make, uh, I'm having trouble explaining it with just words, but if you want to see that next week, I would be happy to do a bunch of slides on that. <laughs> Um, it's not as bad as how I'm probably explaining it. I just use a lot of words every time I try to explain stuff, so it sounds way scary and more complicated than it actually does. So we could do that next next week with pictures, but that's a good question. Any other questions? Cool. I think again. Your MP has a lot of graphs, and we just did recursive stuff for a really specific graph. So again, instead of just knowing that there's one connection, you would just have to keep track of which connections that you've already been at, so you don't enter infinite recursion, but making sure that you get all of them, so not making assumptions on how many connections there can be. But yeah, just about ways about just seeing an example and knowing how to broaden it to fit more cases. Questions there? All right, so for your MP, but I would say just general guidelines. So see what you have. So again, check out the documentation. A lot of it is going to really help, especially looking at the parameter names and descriptions. And then draw it out. Draw out what you actually want to do instead of just opening up your ID and just going for it and hoping for the best. So again, you'll want to establish base cases. So are you stopping at leaves uh, after you've seen all the atoms, after you encounter a specific atom, and how are you representing that? So are you seeing if you've um, reached all atoms after you've encountered one that's being stored in a list that you're passing through each recursive call? Are you at a leaf where the only connection that you have seen is the one that I just came from, stuff like that. So how do you actually represent it in code? So the recursive step, do all the recursion without um, getting stuck in recursion. So basically, 
don't make assumptions on how many connections there are. There are nice helper methods where you can iterate through all the neighbors uh, without getting stuck in recursion, so making sure that you're just not going back and forth between two atoms. And then combining results. So how do we make sure the work that we do isn't lost at the end of the call or accidentally doing duplicate work or any of that? And so do all of the above on paper first, then start coding. Trees will forgive you for using their paper. They told me it's OK. I'm not a crazy lady who talks to trees. They were talking to me. <laughs> all the trees are all the people. <laughs> all the living things are talking to me and telling me I'm crazy. It's fine. <laughs> but despite that, it'll, it'll help with debugging a lot, especially once you actually start following your code and referring back to what you've already drawn out. So that will help you find what mistakes you're making, like, oh, I meant to visit this atom next, and instead um, this happened. And more than likely, it'll save you time because with recursive, with recursive functions, you've probably noticed that the functions are very small, but even the tiniest change makes just a huge impact, like frustratingly huge. So even if you're like, oh, I'm only writing five lines of code, if you've drawn it out, you'll probably know how to better implement those five lines of code. So less headache debugging. Well, that's my rant. Questions there? Cool. So quick review on sorts. Not quick sort, though. I think that'll come Friday. You'll laugh at that joke then. I promise. <laughs> so insertion sort, I like to think of it as the two world sort. So in a world or two worlds sorted and unsorted with a dividing wall. So your outer loop is going to slide the wall each time to include one new citizen or one new element in the array each time. And then your inner loop, you're going to make sure that the citizen is in the proper place. So the algorithm, you go through the length of the array. And then you can actually start at 1 this time, because we're saying that the sorted world, an element by itself, is sorted. So we go ahead and mark the new insert value that we're wanting to insert into the sorted world. And then the while j is greater than or equal to 0, and the element at j is greater than the insert value, we are dragging the element down into its proper place, and then setting everything um, accordingly. So a little animation, sorted world, unsorted world bringing five to the sorted world, putting it in the proper place, all sorted. New citizen, keep sliding, and it goes down. And since it's a GIF, I'll keep repeating. So if you wish to watch the rest of it on your own time, I'll allow you to do that. But I think you would rather me not commentate everything that's happening with insertion sort. So we'll move on to best case and worst case. The interesting thing about insertion sort is actually you can have a best case of O of n. So that would mean that the array is already sorted, so we never actually enter the while loop, because if you remember from before, we need both these conditions to be true in order to keep going. So if our j is less or less than or equal to, in this case, insert val, then we just keep skipping it and go down to the assignment. So we never actually enter the inner while loop. And then it has a worst case and average case of big O of n squared, because we have to enter the while loop, or at least enter it um, on average. Um, still, any sort of fraction of in front of n is going to be n, and then we're going to do that n times, so n squared. 
questions on insertion sort? Cool. Selection sort, I like to think this as the auction sort where everyone wins a space and lowest bid wins. So the value that you have is as an int or whatever data type, but some representation. So whoever has the lowest spot for the current space, you win that spot and then you move on to the next one. So we know for i is equal to zero to length of the array minus one. So kind of like how we knew that um, for insertion sort, um, an array of size one is already sorted, so the sorted world is fine. Well, we know that if we're selecting each and every space, that the very last element of the array didn't um, win a spot in the auction, so they defaulted to the spot that they're currently at. So we assign a min index to i, and then for j is equal to current index through the length of the array, if uh, the value at j is less than the value at min index, we update min index. And then once we go through the loop, we swap i and min index. So again, a nice little animation, kind of faster. So the little black bar is the um, element that's up for auction. And then whoever has the lowest bid ends up winning the spot. And it's all sorted. So that one went faster than the insertion sort. But best case, worst case, average case, it's big O of n squared because regardless on how well it's sorted, we go through both for loops each time. So fairly straightforward. There's no cutting corners like insertion sort where if it's already sorted, then it just goes through it for the length of n. Questions there? All right, bubble sort. So I think bubble sort looks pretty when it's graphed. But so you're bubbling elements to the top. So the assigned seats, but nobody knows each other sort. I think bubble sort's kind of shorter to say, but that's fine. So basically, you just ask two people uh, however way you're sorted, so by birthday. So you decide which, who is older in this case we can go with, and then you swap spots, and you keep going each and every time. And each time, the oldest gets bubbled to the top, and then you have to go again. And if array at j is greater than array at j plus 1, you swap the spaces. So that's where bubble gets the same because you bubble um, the, each of the next largest elements to the very top that it could be. So I have a little GIF. And if you say GIF, you're wrong. Even if the creator called it GIF, he's wrong too. It's fine. It's fine. So we bubble six to the top. We start over. This one's slower. While we keep going, five's going to get bubbled. The spoilers is going to get bubbled again. Haha. <laughs> and if you want to watch the rest of it, feel free. But I'll move on to best case, worst case, average case. So big O of n squared. So um, four loops. Uh, they continue executing regardless on ordering. Um, chances are if you're at an interview and they say sort some elements and you default to bubble sort, they will raise an eyebrow at you. Not as bad as BOGO sort, but we'll get to that. But there are more efficient sorting methods, like even as you saw before, um, insertion sort can actually, um, if you know that elements are already sorted or not too bad off, it's not a horrible sort to pick. Um, it can be optimized for best case of O and O of N, but this is the absolute best case. So you add some sort of flag to see if any swaps occurred. Um, so if any swaps occurred on the first one, 
then, uh, or like the first bubbling, then if no swaps occurred during then, then we know that it's sorted so we could break early. But I wouldn't bank on that if you were using that in an interview. Questions there? Cool on sorts? All right, I switched up. So BOGO sort, because I can, and because it's the best sort ever. So the algorithm is take a bunch of elements, shuffle them, ask yourself, is it sorted? Yes. Yay, you're done. No, go back to step two. So I actually had a professor once who actually tricked a student um, to trying to implement Bogosort with a deck of cards. And the first thing he did was just fling the deck of cards into the air and told the student to pick it up and see if it was sorted. And it wasn't. So he had to toss them again and gave up after like three times. It was awesome. But it's probably going to take more than three times to actually get it. So best case of N, you shuffle it correctly the first time, which probably is not going to happen. But you check to make sure that everywhere is sorted so you can get out in O of N time. Or it can take O of N plus one factorial time to actually get elements that are sorted. So, oh, this is the most horrific, like, <laughs> just audio entering your ears that you can listen to, but it's the theme song. So, um, if you're a polite person, you'll watch it with headphones, but if you like to disturb people, then you'll put it on full blast. <laughs> and then also, there's like a bogo bogo sort, which I still think is the best description, is an algorithm that was designed not to succeed before the heat death of the universe. And there's a recursive component, so if you guys need more practice with recursion, you can implement bogo bogo sort and wait forever to see if it's sorted. But that's my rant. Any questions? Cool. All right. Well, I have extra practice if you guys want to work on anything, if you have um, specific questions or you want, <laughs> or <laughs> if you want um, like more specific practice on anything in particular, feel free to come up, let me know. Um, now is a really, really great time for you to get started on your MP5, but however way you wish to spend the rest of your time, I'll leave that choice to you. Thank you.